morning. Let me invite you to take out your message notes from inside your bulletin. Use those to kind of follow along with us. We're going to be in the Old Testament book of Jonah this morning, so find Jonah. We'll have all the scripture on the screen behind me. And as we begin a new series uh, today, let me take a little bit of a poll. How many of you as a child ever thought about or actually tried to run away from home? Anybody? Raise your hand. I want to see. I'm dating myself. Anybody remember the episode of the Brady Bunch where little Bobby decided to run away and his, his stepmom decided she was going to run away with him? Really had a big impact on my life. And uh, I thought about running away multiple times as a child. Strangely, my parents weren't that opposed to the idea a lot of the time. But anyway, you have to admit, the, it's kind of funny, the thing about running away when you're a kid there's usually a lot of emphasis on the away part. There's not a lot of thought about the to part, right? Which is why the furthest most of us ever got was to the end of the driveway or maybe to the end of the street or if we were really rebellious to a friend's house or maybe to grandma's house. Here's another question and don't raise your hand on this one because this is to some extent true for all of us, I think. But how many of you have ever tried to run away from God. This usually happens about driver's license time forward, doesn't it? This idea of running away from God. But see, running away from God isn't typically a deal where you pack your bags and you go somewhere. Running away from God is usually a little more subtle than that. It's more like I've got to make a decision in my life and I kind of already know what God would say, but I don't want to do that. Running away from God is, I'm going to kind of tone down my conscience by deciding that maybe there is no God. And if there is a God, I'm sure he's way too busy to worry about what I'm doing, so I'll just do what I want. But if you're really, really honest, even in those moments, you still believe there's a God who knows your name. And you still believe to some extent that you are accountable to him you just don't want to think about that in that moment. So you ran away from God into a relationship or maybe into some financial thing. Maybe you felt when you were young that God was nudging you towards some kind of ministry or some type of service occupation. And you thought to yourself, well, there's no way I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life. I'm not doing that. So you kind of put God on the back burner. He's off in your peripheral vision somewhere where you don't feel obligated to really pay any attention to him. You see, we all run from God for basically the same reasons. One of those reasons is that we're afraid of what we might miss out on. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. We're afraid if we surrender to God, we're gonna miss out on good things, good people. For instance, you know that God doesn't want you to get involved with her. She's not a believer. Her values and priorities are not the values and priorities that God wants for you, but you're thinking, okay, anybody can become a Christian, but not everyone can be that beautiful, amen? And so what am, what am I gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead in this relationship, I'm gonna get that all firmed up with her, and then I'll bring her around to the idea of God. It, it's almost like it'll be missionary dating. You see how this works? God is going, oh, you found a loophole, did you? Congratulations, you're so smart. Look, if we're being honest, sometimes we run from God because we're afraid of what we're going to miss out on in our life. Another reason we run is that sometimes we confuse life with God. We confuse life with God. See, sometimes life is hard and life is disappointing and sometimes life doesn't go so well for us and we equate that with God. So when things go wrong, we just blame God and we say, why would I want to do God's will? Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to surrender to God? Look how life slash God has treated me. I don't want to be a part of that if that's what God is about. For some of us, it's a little more complicated. For some of us, we've confused God with a bad church experience, right? 
Maybe we found ourselves as the topic of the rumor mill, or we were betrayed by somebody who was supposed to love us, or maybe we found ourselves in the center of a conflict where church members chose up sides and decided to hate one another. And we allowed that bad church experience, that hurt and that pain to sort of taint our view of God. And so we ran from God and we abandoned his ways. Well, for the next few weeks, beginning today, we're going to talk about this issue, this idea of running from God. And to guide us along the way, we're going to study the life of probably the most famous runner in the Bible, one of my favorite characters to teach on, his name obviously is Jonah. And when I say the name Jonah, you automatically think whale or fish, right? Or maybe it's veggie tales or flannel graph or Sunday school, but you've got an image in your mind. And so for most of us, the only part of the Jonah story we really know is sort of the cartoon version that maybe we learned as a child. But what we're going to see over these next few weeks is that there is much more to Jonah than just a big fish story. Now, the first thing that we need to know is that Jonah was an Old Testament prophet, and the prophets had very tough jobs. We were talking about this in our community group this morning. Prophets were basically like the Navy SEALs of God's work in the world in that time. Prophets were sent into very, very difficult environments to deliver the very message that nobody wanted to hear. Every once in a while, God sends a prophet into your life, doesn't he? Somebody shows up, in your world and says, hey, none of my business, but I think there's something you need to hear. Well, that's kind of what prophets did in the Old Testament. Now, Jonah had a very, very difficult job, even for a prophet, because God didn't send him to the nation of Israel, where at least the people believed in the same God he did. Instead, he sends Jonah to the city of Nineveh. And not only was this a different country where they did not believe in Jonah's God, This was a place where the people can only be described as evil, not semi-evil, not quasi-evil, all right, not the margarine of evil, truly evil, and and, and they were famous for two things, okay? First, when they captured their enemies of war, they would run a brass ring through their nose and then drag them with chains from one battlefield to the next to show their enemies how merciless they were. Then when they got tired of that, they were famous for knowing how to skin people alive without letting them die, okay? Evil, evil people we're talking about here. So when God says, I've seen the wicked things the Ninevites have done, go and tell them to repent before it's too late. Jonah was thinking, hey, I say let's just skip the warning and let's go straight to the judgment because these people are evil, But God said, no. God said, I want you to give them one more chance to see if they will repent. Well, bottom line, Jonah didn't think they deserved a chance to repent. So he did what many of us have done at some point in our lives. And quite honestly, maybe doing right now, he decided that he was going to run from God. Let me read you the first part of Jonah's story from the book of Jonah. Jonah 1, verse 1, says this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now here's an interesting thing. When he decided to run from God, Jonah really ran. Take a look at this picture. I'm going to show you a picture here. The Jonah travel plan, we call it. There's Israel in the middle, kind of the right-hand side of the map. The yellow dot there is Israel. That's where Jonah started out. Top right with the pink arrow pointing at it. Can you guys see that? That's Nineveh where God told Jonah to go. So not, I mean, it was a, it was a ways away, but not very far away in comparison to the known world. To the southwest of Israel, down a little bit to the left, is Joppa, where Jonah got on a boat. It's so small, you actually can't even see it on the map. And then all the way over, all the way to the left-hand side, is Tarshish in modern-day Spain, where you see that other yellow dot. 
And so Jonah was literally headed to the edge of the world as far as he was concerned in order to get away from God's plan. Now, you look at that and you may say, well, that's, you know, that's interesting and all for Jonah. What does that have to do with me? But this is where we find our application because there are several things that are common among people who decide to run from God. And, and I think this map helps us discover some of these, and especially the very first one. I, I would really encourage you to write this in. Runners tend to run to the strangest places. Would you agree with me? Based on your experience, runners tend to run to the strangest places. Think of it this way. In the ancient world, open water was one of the most dangerous things a person could imagine. Okay, they didn't know it like we know it. They didn't understand it like we understand it. So when Jonah decides to run from God and he gets on a boat, that would be like you saying, I'm running from God, I think I'll go bungee jumping. I'm running from God, let's go skydiving. I'm running from God, let's go camping in the mountains of Afghanistan. You have to agree, when Jonah ran, he ran to the strangest place. And really, we're no different, are we? In my time as a pastor, I've met so many people who in rebellion against God decided they would get married. Now that's, that's safe, right? That's a good idea. Or people who've run into all kinds of debt or they've run into business partnerships that were destructive. They just tend to run to the strangest places and here's why. Because when we run from God, we run from the source of wisdom and truth in our life, don't we? They run from the source of wisdom and truth. Have you ever thought about that? That when you disconnect yourself from wisdom and truth, you make unwise decisions based on things that aren't true and won't be nearly as fulfilling as you think that they will. Not only do we run from the source of wisdom and truth, we tend to run from the people that reflect wisdom and truth in our life. You know, I don't know who it is for you. Maybe you used to love your mother-in-law, but not anymore. Because you already know what she's going to say before she even says it, and you don't want to hear it. Remember that godly coworker who used to spend hours encouraging you with biblical advice, always willing to speak the truth in love? Yeah, you can't remember why you ever listened to that crazy person. Tired of hearing what they have to say. We run from the people that reflect wisdom and truth in our life. We also tend to run from the places where we might be confronted with wisdom and truth. You see, when teenagers run, they tend to run from their youth group. When adults run, they tend to run from their church. When college students run, they tend to run from their what? Their family. We just unplug from the sources of wisdom and truth, and then we make unwise decisions based on things that really aren't true and aren't going to come through for us. And then we are shocked at the consequences that inevitably follow those decisions. And that's exactly what Jonah did too. In fact, listen to what happens to Jonah in verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now again, scariest thing you can imagine is open water in that time. All the sailors, verse 5, were afraid and each cried out to his own God and then they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. I don't know if that was going to help, but I don't think they had anything else they could do. And remember, these are sailors, all right? These are not men who are probably very easy to scare when it came to life on the sea, and yet they're terrified. They dealt with the wind before. They'd been through storms before, but this was something different. They were scared to death. And where do you suppose Jonah was during all of this? Do you remember? Verse five, but Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up, call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Here's the second thing that we notice about runners. Runners are often the last to make the connection between their decision to run and the chaos that follows. Do you see? 
Jonah is just taking a nap. He's just having a good time. He's just enjoying the friendly seas. When everybody else is in chaos, everybody else is in a panic, and that is what typically happens with runners. Now, as an outsider, as a parent, as a grandparent, maybe even as a son or a daughter, as you watch your parents' marriage or, or their individual lives kind of unravel, from the outside, you look at the decisions they're making to turn their back on God, and then you look at the chaos that ensues, right? You look at the actions, you look at the consequences, and it's so clear to you that these two things are absolutely connected, but the runner is usually the last person to get it. Do you know people like this in your life? If you don't, it's probably you. See, the people who love you the most, they will often see it long before you do. And they will try to be the prophet. And they will try to say to you, hey, there are these two dots. I'd like to help you connect them. And you'll say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't think those two things have anything to do with one another. I have sat and talked to people who are in the midst of terrible crisis. And I'll say to them, okay, you did this, and now there's this. Do you, do you not see it? Nope, I don't see a connection. How can that be? Right now, you've got somebody in your life. If it's not you, you've got somebody who's running. And you're looking at them, and you don't know whether to, to embrace them or slap them upside the head, do you? They don't get it. Well, you know why? It's because when you're running, you're usually the last to see the connection between your decision to stiff arm God and the chaos that eventually, eventually, inevitably, and always ensues in your life. Here's verse seven. Then the sailors said to each other, come let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Verse 11. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know this is my fault, that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, please, Jehovah, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Jehovah, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared Jehovah and they offered a sacrifice to Jehovah and made vows to him. And then notice this next phrase. This is verse 17. Now the Lord. I don't know if you noticed, but first it was then the Lord. And Jonah gets the storm of a lifetime. Now it's now the Lord. Can you guess what's coming next? Anybody? Verse 17, here we go. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, let's just take a second. Let's let that sink in. All right, Jonah was a runner, and like all runners, he ran to the strangest, most dangerous place. Also, like a typical runner, he was the last to make the connection between his actions and the consequences that followed. But now that he's sitting in the belly of a giant fish, I think he's starting to connect the dots, don't you? We pick up a story now in chapter 2. Move to the right, verse 1. It says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And I wrote in my notes, I bet he did. I bet he did. 
And in that moment, Jonah recognized something else that every runner eventually discovers. Listen to me. Runners can run from God, but they can't outrun God. You can run from him, but you can't outrun him. Here's the deal. Like Jonah, you can run from God. You can turn your back on him in your relationships, in your finances, in your career. You can be the very last person on earth to recognize the consequences of your rebellion. You can even run as far from him as you think you can possibly, possibly get. But in the end, you cannot outrun the love of your heavenly father. You may experience some then the Lord, now the Lord moments. And they may hurt. And they may be confusing. And they may even cause you to have some bitter feelings towards God. But you need to understand that those hard moments are just an expression of his love for you. Listen to Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Such an important verse. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son, he delights in. Here's the thing. If you are actively or maybe subtly running from God, you need to know something. God is looking for you. Not because he wants to pay you back, but so he can win you back. Do you understand the difference? That may be a phrase that sounds familiar to you because I've used it before. God does not want to pay you back. He wants to win you back. And the reason that I can say that with absolute confidence, you, you may look at me and say, well, Justin, how do you know that? How do you know he doesn't want to pay me back? You don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. This isn't about you. This is about him. I can say it with confidence, even though I don't necessarily know your story, because 750 years after this, and 2,000 years ago, he sent his son into the world to pay completely for your sins so that you don't have to be punished for them, so that I don't have to be punished for them. Punishment has been dealt with, all right? Payback has been dealt with. From this point forward, it's win back. It's bring back. Because as a father disciplines his child, so your heavenly father will discipline you to bring you and win you back. Let me ask you a question. Like Jonah, have you been running from God? Have you been running to the most dangerous places? Have you been separating yourself from the people and the places that would influence you with wisdom and with truth? Have you slowly watched all of your plans just fall apart? What was once a thrill has now become an addiction. What once felt so incredible has now become a nightmare. Have you failed to connect the dots? Your mama tried to connect them. Your spouse tried to connect them. Your parents, even your kids may have come to you and said, Dad, Mom, can you not see what's going on here? Let me encourage you today. Connect the dots. Connect the dots. Admit to him that you have been a runner. Accept the fact that he's not trying to pay you back. He's desperately trying to win you back. And all it takes on your part, I know this can be hard to believe, but hear me. All it takes on your part is an act of surrender. Let's pray together this morning. Oh, God. I know that in my own life, I deal with this and I see this and I've been a runner before and, and I've loved runners. 
I desperately wanted them to surrender to you. God, I know that in this room there are people who are running, and I know that there are people who are parents of runners and friends and co-workers of runners. And I don't know everybody's story, Father. I don't. But I do know how naturally this comes to us. And I just pray this morning that we would begin to connect the dots. I pray that for anybody who's been running for you, from you, that, that they would just find a way to admit to you that they've run from you. And God, maybe more than anything, that they would accept the fact that you're not trying to pay them back. That's not who you are. That's not what you're about. You have already taken care of that part through Jesus. So help them to see all that remains is a simple act of surrender. And God, I don't know what that act of surrender looks like, Maybe it's somebody coming and getting on their face before you. Maybe it's a prayer that needs to be prayed to you. Maybe it's a confession that needs to be given to somebody. I don't know, but I trust you that you will show us in our own hearts what that needs to look like today. And I just pray that we would be obedient to you. Help us during these next few moments to be committed to surrender. Help us, God. We love you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Paul.